Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Maeve Clark. I'm the Information Services Coordinator here at the Iowa City Public Library. <laughs> this is an event of many different organizations. First of all, it is brought to you by the Center for Sustainable Communities, and they are doing wonderful things throughout the state, so do take an opportunity to look at their website. Also, this is part of Irving Weber Day's month, our um, celebration of Irving Weber, a local historian of great import to the Iowa City area and to particularly the Iowa City Public Library. This is also brought to you by the Iowa City Public Library. And as part of that Eco Iowa City, which is a grant funded through the International City and County Management Association from the, um, along with the Iowa City Recycling Center. And some of you I recognize from coming to get rain barrels this morning <coughs> at the Iowa City Fire Training Center. And they're all gone, sorry, but it was a lovely event. And so there'll be other things that Eco Iowa City is doing. But without any further ado, I will, t oh, one last thing. I control the microphone. So this is a live presentation on Library Channel 10, which means that it will be played over and over and over again. So if you have friends who have missed it, they can watch it on Channel 10. Or we will make a disc of this available, and it will circulate in the library's collection. And the Center for Sustainable Communities will also have a disc. And then you are going to do what with that disc? They'll do something with it on their website. So we are spreading the word about Bob Yap and Windows. So I have a microphone, and when you have a question, I'm not quite sure how you want questions to be asked, but I will hand the microphone to you because if people are watching from home, people at home, they would like to hear the question, and if we don't have the microphone, they can't hear it. So please cooperate with me because it will help everyone, <laughs> and it's the friendly thing to do. Sounds so, like a librarian, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does sound like a librarian. So without any further ado, I will turn this over to Bob and let him tell you a little bit about himself. Thank you very much Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. I love to be back to Iowa City. I lived here for so many years. I never did get a degree. I had over 200 hours, so I had to leave and go to another college to get a degree. Um, I love Iowa City. My son went here, and he partied too much, so now he's getting his degree at ASU. So what, you know, what are you going to do? Um, anyway, I'm glad you're all here. Um, uh, when I wake up in the morning, my wife reminds me that I'm only a legend in my own mind, and I think that's important for people to know. Um, I've been around historic preservation for 37 years. Um, I'm working on my 152nd ground up restoration of historic property, all endangered. Uh, people ask me, do I ever get tired of this? And I must be mentally deranged because I, I love it more every time I do it. How many people here would I mean, this, is, this is audience participant, okay? This is very important. And you can't lie to me because I'll know when you're lying, okay? Just so you know. I'm very good at that. How many people here would consider themselves to truly be historic preservationists? All right. You see Amy back here? You see? She, raise your hand, Amy. She has the pamphlet for the 12-step program to get over it. <laughs> you make sure you get one when you go out because... It's a left-wing conspiracy to take people's property rights away, right? I mean, isn't that what preservation is? I mean, that's what we get all the time everywhere I go. I was in Cedar Rapids this morning, and I'll never forget about eight years ago, the city of Cedar Rapids called me and said, oh, you've got to come over here now. We've got a problem. We've got a local district. Does everybody here know the difference between local districts and national districts? National is where the, the National Park Service and the State Historic Preservation Office decides that, that your contiguous area has enough integrity to be a national register district, whereas a local district is where you have some property rights. You see, most people that don't like historic preservation ordinances think you're a second-class citizen, that you don't have any rights. And the reason that they think that is because they go out into the cornfield developments, hire a builder to design a house, that's really brilliant, isn't it? And they build this thing that if you had one glass of wine too many, you'd probably walk in the wrong house, and in some states you'd get shot. Probably not in Iowa. But, uh, you know, the most redeeming architectural features are three-car garage, vaulted ceilings, vinyl siding, and this is, this is what you end up getting. So the, the point of all of this is that the covenants and new developments are far more restrictive than local historic preservation ordinances, far more restrictive. And those are the people that oftentimes are wanging the most about us having some controls over what we do in our central city neighborhoods. 
And of course, all these ordinances are only for the exterior, what can be seen from a visible right of way. And so we have some rights too. And, uh, I, and I, how many architects are here? Please raise your hand. One, two. I love architects. I work with them all the time. God bless you. I never say God bless it to anybody, but I say that to architects because 15 years ago they joined our green movement. Isn't that exciting? We started it about 35 years ago. There's nothing greener than an old house. There's nothing less green than building something new. The least sustainable thing that you can do is build something new. The most sustainable thing you can do is recycle something that already exists. Our built environment has embodied energy. And, um, and I've done new construction, gotten Leeds points. I hardly ever get Leeds points for rehab because Leeds has not done a good job in working with us over the years. So um, everybody know what Leeds is? It's a, it's a rating system for uh, green construction. So we're working with them and we're trying to get them to recognize the fact that we can make any old window more energy efficient than a replacement window for less money and that people gotta need to quit buying into the marketing. How many people here believe that if an industry spends $100 million a year to tell you to buy their product, you should automatically run out and buy it? Nobody ever raises their hand. Nobody. How many people here have replaced the windows in a house or the house they live in now? And don't lie to me. Tell me the truth. Anybody in this room? No, nope. there you go. Okay, there's an honest person. How about siding on your house? Okay. Well, there's two things that are, are, are all about the marketing and nothing about objectivity, research, or science. Uh, because we now know that replacement siding creates a vapor barrier on the wrong side of the wall and starts to trap moisture and create all kinds of problems. And we now know that you can restore windows, make them easier to operate than a replacement window, just as easily clean from inside the house, so you never have to get on a ladder to clean them, and they have a higher U-value than a replacement window for at or less money. And that's really changing now. You ever heard of the EPA? Good old EPA. I've been fighting with them for years. Because they have been telling you, and HUD as well, that there's an epidemic in lead poisoning in children today. And guess what? That's an absolute lie. It is not true. There is no epidemic in lead poisoning in children today. Lead poisoning is down by a hundredfold in children today. And not much of it has to do with lead paint regulation. Most of it has to do with taking lead out of factory emissions and automobile gasolines and, and all those kinds of things. We started to get a little reversal of that in the last administration, but hopefully we'll continue on with that. We also find that the dirt around houses is where the highest concentration of lead is in old houses. Because people would scrape old houses and not tarp off the ground or what have you. But there's a lot of concern about lead. The two, highest, the two groups that have the highest incidence of lead poisoning in this country today are um, uneducated single mothers. That just happens to be a fact. And the other one are overeducated rehabbers. Go figure, right? <laughs> I've lived, I was a single father from the time my daughter was one and a half and my son was three. And they've lived in all these houses and buildings that I've done. Everything from buying up an entire block of abandoned houses to buying old schools and turning them into high-end loft condominiums with upscale retail on the ground floor. You name it, I've done it. And they've lived in them all, and they've all had massive lead removal going on in every single project, and they've never had an elevated lead level in their lives because they use common sense. I never dry scraped. I always wetted things down. I always made a room so it was completely separated from the rest of the rooms. I always wore very colorful boxer shorts. Now, why would you want to know that? Well, because I'd work in the room, I'd tape off the doorway, I'd get all done for the day, I'd climb out the window, take off all my clothes inside the room except these big flowery boxer shorts, put it all in a garbage bag, climb out the window, go down into the basement, and double wash my clothes. You have to double wash clothes when you're working around old paint. And I never washed them with anything else. My neighbors thought it was pretty weird, but you know, nonetheless, uh, the fact is, is that I, I created an environment that didn't cause lead poisoning. How many people here are contractors? Anybody? You, you, you know about the new lead rules, the EPA? Yeah. So as of April 23rd, if you're not licensed by the EPA, 
Um, you can't work on houses built before 1978. Did you know that? <laughs> and that is really bizarre. I went and took the course, and basically they, they told us to do about half of what we've been doing for 20 years. The good news is, is that it's going to stop the vinyl pirates. The guys that are slamming up vinyl siding, the guys that are putting in vinyl windows, they can't do it anymore unless they're licensed by the EPA on any house built before 1978. If you hire a contractor to paint your house and he's not licensed by the EPA, he's in violation of federal law and subject to a fine of $37,500. That really blows people's minds away. I have no idea how they're going to enforce this. I don't think they can unless people start ratting each other out like we're in the old Soviet Union. I, I, I can't imagine that that's going to happen. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's finally saying three things that, that have been so anti-preservation. They can no longer just come in and do it. They have to be careful about dealing with lead dust just like we rehabbers have been forever. Siding, replacement siding, replacement windows, whether it's Pella or a vinyl window, doesn't make any difference. And no more power washing. Thank God. Power washing is the number one prescription for paint failure in this country. It's the number one reason for damage to brick next to sandblasting, which we don't do anymore. Now, you could power wash, but you have to contain all the water to get rid of. So good luck with that if you power wash. That's going to be a little bit tough. So people freak out about it. I don't think we need to freak out about it. I think we just need to use common sense, and I'm going to walk you through how we do that with windows. Last weekend, I had 12 architects at my school in Hannibal, Missouri, where I live now. I have a school there called the Belvedere School for Hands-On Preservation. It's a national school, <laughs> and we teach hands-on everything from repointing brick and stone to three-coat plaster to passive floor restoration, where you don't use a grinder and grind all the character out of the floors, to window restoration and everything in between. And um, uh, not one of them got a dose of lead over the weekend, and they were all m removing mass quantities of lead. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hang on. She's going to bring that mic over to you. Mind the librarian. That's my motto. Thanks. Sure, sorry. Um, do, do the EPA rules on lead apply to homeowners as no. well? This is for contractors and landlords. If you're a landlord and you work on your property that's built before 1978, you have to be licensed. If you are a house flipper and you live in the house, you don't have to be licensed. Um, and inexplicably, they've exempted preservation trade schools, which is just insane because we're working with lead all the time. So I have this adult school, so homeowners can work on their own houses. But please practice safe lead. I mean, you don't want to get lead poisoned. It's no big deal. It's just, you know, unstable lead can be an issue, lead dust. When we go into those uh, uh, uneducated single mother families and teach them how to dust their homes, we find that lead poisoning goes down over 90% in those properties. So it's all about using common sense. And, you know, we, we hire a housekeeper to come in as part of our rehab costs whenever uh, my wife Pat and I are doing something. Um, and they dust in, every week, and we just, you know, we keep it down. Um, so I think that's important. Uh, so anyway, I, don't freak out about lead. It's not that big of a deal. But be, be aware that the EPA is going to be, they've hired this, this huge group of people that are going to go all over the country and start getting all of the licenses from the local building code officials and going out and checking all the job sites of all the contractors that are licensed in your town. And so everybody should take that class. It's a one-day class. It's absolutely nothing. Uh, trust me. And they don't even know what they're doing. I'll give you an example. Lead paint becomes a toxic vapor if it's over 640 degrees. This is science. This has been established for ages. The EPA trainers say you can use a heat gun up to 1,100 degrees. And I stopped this guy and I said, well, well wait a minute. He said, oh, that's right. Maybe we should change that. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, so, Rehabbing old windows. What do people hate about old windows? Well, I'll tell you what they hate about old windows. You know what they hate. They hate the fact that the putty's fallen out of them and they're all rattling around in their openings and that the ropes break and they're just, they're just, they're just a pain. And, and so why can't I just have a good Iowa company like Pella come and put windows in my house? 
Well, I want you to do that if you want to pay more money than you should and have the least energy efficient property that you can have. Windows are 15% at the most of the, uh, of the heat uh, issues in an old house. Heat travels like a chimney in a house. Air infiltration is an issue, but you can stop all the air infiltration around windows. The biggest scam in America today is insulated glass, double pane glass. Everybody thinks, oh, I have to have double pane glass. Well, the, 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 if you look at the studies that have been done about this, what do they say? Well, IG Cardinal, big flat glass manufacturer up in Minnesota, they make big sheets of glass, sell it to Anderson and Pella, Marvin, all these different companies. They did what's called accelerated testing. Now, accelerated testing is when they get into a lab and they throw sleet and rain and they, they, they simulate 20 years of time. And what they found was that in 90% of the grade of residential windows that are going in, whether they're wooden or vinyl, that the seals between the panes of glass fail in the first three to five years. This is a vinyl, I don't even like to touch it, but this is a vinyl window that popped out of its opening because of the extreme contraction and expansion in a southern exposure. It's also banged up in my case quite a bit. It's made with vinyl that's never had sex, virgin vinyl, you've heard of that. I'm not sure quite what that means. You all understand, the people here understand that this is the least environmentally sound product ever manufactured. This is the most toxic consumer substance ever created on the planet. And that doesn't come from me. When I first heard this, I was very skeptical. But you start to go and talk to the environmental chemists at some of the top universities in the country, and they just automatically, yes, it's the most toxic consumer substance ever created on the planet. The fire chiefs of America are estimating that 60% of the people that die in house fires are dying from toxic off-gassing from overheated PVC before the smoke or fire ever gets to them. All of your drain piping, unless you live in an old house that still has cast iron in it. In Chicago, you had to use cast iron drain waste lines until about five years ago, but that didn't have anything to do with the environment. It had to do with the union wanting to make more money putting in cast iron. And now they use this. That new smell in your car? That's toxic off-gassing from PVC. Drive out into one of these new cornfield developments. You know, that blue haze over the top, that's off-gassing from PVC. That's some nasty stuff, folks, I'm telling you. Your kids' toys are made out of it. They've got it in their mouths. It's nasty. It causes some of the worst liver cancer that you could ever imagine. In a 40-mile radius around every plant in Louisiana, people are dying of liver cancer. In, in Italy, they, they prosecuted the executives of the PVC plants. Um, criminally prosecuted them. It's just really bad. Now, take that out of the equation. I don't know how you can, but let's take it out of the equation for a moment. And let's think about how this is constructed. There's a piece of glass on this side and a piece of glass on this side. In between is a, is, is a strip of metal. There are different types of strips that it gets glued to. The glass gets glued to either side. What do you notice about that strip as you look at it? That metal strip in between, what do you see in that? Perforated? It's perforated. Pass this around, but don't like cut yourself on it. Um, it's perforated because the window industry knows that the seals are going to fail in the first three to five years. And when the condensation gets in there, that little metal strip is filled with what's called a desiccant. That's that little bag in your pill bottle that absorbs moisture. Well, we now know that from studies that desiccants have a maximum lifespan of five, six years at the most. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's say the seals in 90% in in of the replacement windows in, an old in, in residential housing last six years instead of five. And let's give that another six years. And that desiccant, it's whether, regardless of whether it's absorbing moisture or not absorbing moisture, it will not absorb moisture after six years. So here we have this window. And in 12 years, you've got uh, you know, major seal, you have seal failure before that, but the seal failure then takes away from some of the effectiveness of the idea of an air gap between the glass. <clears throat> so, here's the really interesting part. The window replacement industry is, a, is an $8 billion a year industry for residential alone. There's, a, there's an organization that's a trade organization. They put out a magazine that if they knew I subscribed to, they'd probably put a hit out on me. It's called Glass Magazine. And it's a trade industry magazine. And a, a few years back, the editor of this uh, magazine said, 
and I'm paraphrasing, but you can get all of these quotes from, AIM, uh, fr from the uh, sustainability organization. They have a disk with all the, the research that I'm talking about that you can access from them. Um, Charles Cumston said, you know, we're satisfied knowing that the average replacement window in a house lasts 15 years. If the consumer knew it, we'd be in trouble. Then Ted Hart, who was also a writer for this magazine, said a year or two before that, that it is criminal with full knowledge to build a superior window other than an insulated glass window. We choose to build an inferior single-sealed double-pane window. And I hear this over and over. None of this has changed. Now, it's not the same in big commercial windows. They're doing triple ceiling. They have a whole different, it's a whole different animal. We're talking about residential housing windows here now. And that's important to remember. So, we've got accelerated testing by the biggest glass manufacturer in the Midwest. We've got the, the industry itself saying there's a problem. We've got an $8 billion a year business. That's a lot of money. We throw billions around anymore like it's nothing, but that's a lot of cash. That's a big business. What does that mean? Well, that means that this, there are 100, up until five years ago, there were tw about 12 million of these old growth wood sashes going to the dump every single year. 12 million. That's changed in the last five years. It's about 8 million old growth sashes because the other 4 million are windows that are less than 15 years old. It's the highest number of windows being replaced. Uh, it per, it, if you look at the percentages and how fast it's happening, it's happening so fast it's scary. Now, I don't take anything from anybody. When I was on PBS, part of the reason I'm not on PBS anymore, we have five million viewers a week, we, it's double what this old house ever had. We're the most popular home improvement show in the history of this country. And we were on for three years. And I ticked off PBS because I refused to take free half million dollar woodworking shops like Norm. I, for, I, I refused to take free geothermal systems and roofs. And when one of my underwriters, who put up half of the two million a year to do the show, said, I want you to promote vinyl siding and vinyl windows on the show, I told him to take a look at where the sun doesn't shine, and I walked. Because I have one client, and that's the consumer. End of story. You go on my website, bobyap.com, there's no advertising. It's all about getting good information out to people and finding out where the objective information is. Um, and, and it's out there. You know, when I, I wasn't kidding when I said, how many of you believe that you should just run out and do what everybody says? Because that's what we do. Where do we get our information? From marketing. And it, it, is, it is not good information. The reason that you don't hear about a lot of the things I'm going to walk you through today is because it's, it's all re university studies, it's not for profits, it's field studies that, from people and organizations that don't have hundreds of millions of dollars to get the objective information out to you. Um, so I try to ferret it out the best I can. So everybody complains about old windows. This is out of my, the school, the Belvedere School for Hands-On Preservation in Hannibal, Missouri. How many people have been to Hannibal? Hannibal is a rocking place, man. I have. That's good. And it's, uh, it's, it's become almost an expatriate place. It's an oxymoron to say you're an expatriate living in the same country you're born in. But, I mean, we have artists leaving Santa Fe, New Mexico, and coming to Hannibal. It's just getting to be a really fun and interesting place. And, it, and it's real hilly like San Francisco. And it's all pre-Civil War. It was founded in, in 1818. And, and uh, there's a slavery element to it, which is very uh, just bizarre to me, being from Des Moines. You know, it's like uh, I didn't even, I mean, I knew about it, but who knew? So this is, an, this is a 150-year-old window. This has never been restored. Now, some of the glass is broken out and some of it's cracked. It's got its original cylinder glass in it. Cylinder glass is what wavy glass is. How many people have heard uh, this uh, research about how glass stays liquid and it gets fatter at the bottom and st uh, on its edges? Anybody heard this? Yeah, it's all bull. It's not true. It's, it's just not true. The reason that glass is thicker on the edges is because when they make cylinder glass back in the old days before, now we have what's called float glass which is very uniform, and they, the formulas are all very uniform. But they used to throw potash and anything else they could find on the ground into these big pots in the sand and everything, stick it in the ovens, cook it down until it was melted, and they'd wheel it out, and they'd have these big, gigantic pipes that they cut in half along their length, and sometimes wooden half cylinders all along these long tables. And they pour this liquid molten glass over these cylinders. 
and then as it starts to cool down, they stick it back in the oven to warm it up a little bit, bring it out, flip it over flat onto a big platen or flat table. And it, that, that's where all the imperfections come from. And when it's over this half cylinder, the edges down here are fatter because it's gravity. So the idea that glass actually keeps moving throughout its lifetime is just scientifically not a fact. Um, but it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting urban legend, to say the least. This is all cylinder glass. Um, I try to keep it as much as I can. In the old days, we would lose 20 to 30 percent of the glass when we were restoring windows because this tool, which was about all we had back in the old days, is, is, uh, can really break glass. And uh, there's, there's ways to avoid it. But this will go up to about 1,200 degrees. This is an adjustable one, and at half, the half setting, it comes to 600 degrees. Don't ever use a heat gun that isn't adjustable heat, because it will heat up the paint over 640 degrees and make you sick, which I don't want you to do. This, this tool has a place in window restoration, but it's not the primary tool that we use. So anyway, all the different things that everybody hates about this. Now, like I said, we used to, be, to get the putty out and all that, we used to use heat guns. Today we use this. And this is from Sweden. This is an infrared heating device. And it's, it will not heat over 540 degrees. Glass generally won't break unless you leave it on there for a long, long time. Anything will heat up. Um, but it, 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 it doesn't take paint off and putty by heating the paint. It takes it off by heating the wood. And the resin in the wood rises to the surface and pushes the paint out of the molding profiles and off the flats. And then we use what's called a hook shave. There's a couple of variations of hook shaves to pull the paint off because it, it comes off. I mean, this thing's the size of a loaf of bread. And it literally, this arm is adjustable so when you have this sash on a bench, you can set it up so that it props itself up. Um, th this revolutionized... Uh, window restoration for us. It, 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 it just made it an amazing uh, situation. This window was under a porch. That's why it's in such good condition. And this is the original feather graining. Back in the 1850s, natural wood was not groovy. You had to have your own faux painter to be really groovy. So everything in my house is faux painted. Um, And so anyway, so here, this is a six over six. Anybody know what these are called? Mullions or muttons? Muttons, thank you. I have this one elderly woman who emails me about once a month. If you don't stop telling everybody that those are muttons, I just don't know what I'm going to do. A mullion divides two window openings. And a mutton divides panes of glass. So we call this a six over six. This is the top sash. Um, for uh, these, this is the size of all the windows in our house. Uh, 1859, uh, brick house, interesting construction, three bricks thick on the first floor, two bricks thick on the second floor. I'd never seen that before, but everything in Hannibal was built that way, and all the bricks were made locally. House has been painted since the day it was built. It had a red lime wash put on it. All the mortar joints were red. Uh, they knew their brick was not that hard, so they protected it early on. All right, to get, so to get this paint off, we're using infrared heating devices, but we also, I wish I had a, uh, let me get a couple chairs over here so we can set this up. Excuse me. All right, I'm going to set this up on here. Like this. We, we take a lot of windows out at once, so we'll go in and we'll take six. Like last weekend when I had the architects there, we took six complete window openings out of this, 12 sashes. All the lead paint and putty was out of those sashes in teams of two in an hour and 15 minutes on, on two of these. So each two-person team was able to get all this out. We use these speed heaters so that if this was a bench, again, this is my arm that will hold this so that I can get this over and heat up the paint. It also will heat up the putty. The one thing that we do is we take these little pieces of flashing, you can buy these at the lumber yard, and we put them over the glass. And that way, 
it reflects the heat away from the glass, and we don't break hardly any glass this way. Once we heat this up, it starts to smoke. And you're thinking, oh, Maria, it's smoking. I better get it off of there. That's the resin, not the paint. And, uh, that's what you start to smell it. And the smell is so different than you. A lot of people have smelled lead paint. I know I have. And um, the resin in the wood starts to come up. And then we take the, um, I don't know where to put it there. We take a hook shave like this. We move this down to the next section. We pull the paint off this way. And then we take this tool. This is my favorite tool in the world. This is a roller chisel. It has a roller bearing on this so that you can then move it along here and it rolls along there and it takes the putty out without messing up this line of wood, this edge of wood right here at the top of the glazing bed, which you don't want to do because that's where you run your putty knife. So if, you, if you're taking a chisel and you're digging into this edge, your putty's going to look like this. If you have a nice clean edge, your putty's going to be nice and smooth. So that's important. So that's how this thing works. There's another tool out there that a lot of people are using and I don't like. I built one and then I disassembled it and, 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 and I don't like it. It's a steam box. It looks like a pizza oven. You can make it out of foam board uh, and just cheap wood. And it li literally it looks like a pizza oven and you can stick two sashes in it at once and you take a like a commercial steamer, a jiffy steamer that you can buy, and you hook it into the back of it, and it steams the paint and the putty off, and it does a good job of doing that. The problem is it drives moisture into the wood, and it fuzzes the wood all up. Now, when I did my apprenticeship as a furniture designer and maker with a German, I wasn't even allowed to use, we never used sandpaper the whole time I did this. We were making Chippendale high boys with fan carvings and Scandinavian stuff. We never used sandpaper. We used scr cabinet scrapers so that we would actually smooth the wood down with this. And we put a little burr on this edge. Today, you've got carbide scrapers, one of the great tools. You can't, you can't rehab an old house without a carbide scraper. They're, you could shave with these. They're so short. And they're two-sided blades, and you can flip them around. They're not real good for pulling off large amounts of paint because there's not much room behind it. That's why we tend to use these big hook shaves when we're pulling paint off. Never dry scrape anything. That's really important. Uh, always mist it with a little bit of water. A little uh, paint plant bottle like this, mist it a little bit and do it. But the thing about the steamer <laughs> is that it, it injects moisture into the wood. Now, in our climate, you cannot paint wood that's, o that's over 15% moisture content. I'm, I'm doing the EPA class, and there's this guy, who, John Roberts, this guy I know in Hamill. The name of his company is Roberts Power Washing. And he almost attacked the instructor who told him to put functional power washing. Uh, I went outside and talked to him a little bit, and I said, so how long are your paint jobs lasting? He says, I can only get them to last four years. I said, well, so you're power washing, and then when are you painting? He says, well, if it's sunny, the next day. And we did a test when I was doing the PBS show. We went to Minneapolis, Kansas City, and Des Moines, top painters in town, power washing the houses. They waited three days in the sun, and they started priming. We went back, and we used one of these, which is called a moisture meter, and everything was over 30% moisture. And they were priming it. Those paint jobs all failed immediately. It's not a matter of failing in three or four years. They fail immediately. The water vapor in wood, if it's over 15% moisture content, is too much moisture vapor and paint will not adhere to it. Now, you might have a side up here that's 14%, one down here is 13%, and everything in between is 18 So it'll hook on here and here, but gravity will make it start to come off this way. So it's really important to own one of these. What's really nice is that Wagner that makes this one makes a whole bunch of different ones. You can get these multi-testers that will test plaster and brick and all kinds of things. So if you have a leak in your ceiling and you don't know where it's coming from, you can take this and follow that leak and it might be on a chimney clear on the other side of the house with bad flashing. It's running down a rafter, coming over here and getting down over on the other side of the house. A moisture meter is a really good thing to have. This one is idiot proof. That's why I own it. And it's uh, 375 bucks. It's very expensive. It sends a wave into the wood and I can, I can vary it based on species. You can buy this one for about 50 bucks. 
and it's about all a homeowner really needs. It plugs into the side here, and it's got these two prongs that you can put in the middle of the wood, as deep as you can get them in, and it'll tell you what the moisture content is. It won't do plaster or brick or anything like that, but they're, uh, they're a really good tool to have. And so I always check my windows. Now, after I get done using the speed heater, it warms the wood up enough. If there's any moisture in it, it comes out. But we check these steam boxes, and you can go online and buy the plans for them for $19.99 or something like that. Uh, and, the, and it took four or five days for it to get down to 15%. And that's too long for me because, you know, the big lie is that preservation is expensive. It's not expensive. Preservation, preserving, maintaining original materials isn't expensive. It costs less. That's why I have never replaced a window. I've restored over 7,000 windows, but I've never replaced one because I want my buildings energy efficient and I don't want to spend too much money. We look at something different today than we used to look at in, in the energy efficiency of windows. We used to look at R values. We've all heard of R values, right? You want R38 in your attic, R8, whatever you can get in your walls, all this kind of thing, right? Well, we look at U values, the letter U now. The lower the U value, the better. A U value is how much heat will transfer through a one square foot area of a window. Not just, not just the glass, it takes the whole unit into consideration. One square foot in one hour. That's what a U value is. All right, so what about U values? Let me see this for a second. This is a study that was done. You all have this, I think. And this shows a cheesy double hung window, original old window that hasn't been restored. With, with an old storm over it, no weather stripping whatsoever, and it has a .50 U value, and a brand new replacement window with double pane glass has a .58. That window with the, that aluminum storm that you guys hate so much, it breaks your fingernails off and isn't even a good windbreak, you have better U value with that old window with no weather stripping and that aluminum storm than you do with a replacement window the day it goes in. But people are telling you that that's not true. They're lying to you. They're not telling you the objective truth. I'm going to walk you through how we do our windows, and we end up getting a point, anywhere from a point two eight to a, a point, uh, a point three two, which is significantly less, lower number than point five zero. And 0.5, what is it they're saying? 0.58 for a replacement window. I want, like I said, I want my windows to be energy efficient. Now, an architect friend of mine in New York named Walter Sedevac did a study on this. And you can also get this information from the sustainability folks. This is a piece of glass um, that has 99 plus UV protection with no low E coatings on it. This is a piece of glass that's more soundproof than double pane glass or insulated glass. It's safer. And while it isn't the same U value as a double pane window, it, it gets close because it has a thermal break in the middle. It's laminated glass. And it has a polyethylene piece of plastic in between and two pieces. It's what's in your car. And it's about a third cheaper than buying a, a double pane retrofit for an old window. I don't put these in windows. I put them in storms. And the reason I put them in storms is because if I add weight to an old window sash, I'm going to have to either add more weight to the, the sash weights or I'm going to have to get rid of sash weights. And I don't want to do that because this, let's see if I can find all my stuff here, this and this are the best way to raise and lower a window that was ever invented. The double hung window we think came around in the mid 1400s and it was invented, it originally didn't have sash weights, it had these pull pins, spring loaded pins or just push pins. Um, I'm going to be doing a window restoration boot camp in uh, Pier, North Dakota next week on a, a ch an old chapel that was built in the early 1800s. It doesn't have sash weights, it has those pull pins. <laughs> the, um, the spring balances, the cheesy vinyl jam liners that have all this foam back, it's all garbage. They don't last. They're not sustainable. We need to be looking at things. When my father was this very stern six foot six corporate executive. He ran a company called Ortho Lawn and Garden out of Des Moines. My mother was a feminist op-ed writer for the New York Times who hung out with Bella Abzug and Gloria Steinem. 
<laughs> and um, dinner was interesting at my house, to say the least, because my father was a Barry Goldwater Republican. So, <laughs> yeah, it was really interesting. And I was a raging anti-war guy. So anyway, it was a very interesting time. But my father always told me, he said, we don't own this house. And if you think we do, and you will never own a house. Because how, we are stewards of these old houses. It's our responsibility to do good work that will last. That's what sustainability is, right? Thinking about the environment and doing work that lasts. That's what sustainability is in its base root. I'm sure that the organization could give a much broader definition. But from my perspective out in the field, that's what sustainability is. And I do believe that we have a responsibility to the next generation. Um, it, it's, it's amazing to me that we are willing, you know, and I get, I get seniors that will say, well, I don't care. I'm not going to live in my house that much longer. I'm just going to throw some vinyl siding up on it, and then I won't have to think about it. Well, the first sign that a neighborhood's in decline is when the replacement windows start going in and the replacement siding goes in. Statistically, that's the first sign that a neighborhood is going to be in decline because what is it saying? It's saying that people aren't willing to maintain or take care of their homes anymore. And so when I, when I have seniors that tell me this, I love them and I give, put my arm around them and I say, you really hate your grandchildren that much? And that seems harsh, but it really is true. We have a responsibility to do things well and not screw things up, especially our old houses. And do I like the cultural aspects of historic preservation? Very dear to me. It's very dear to me. I understand it, the social policy aspects of all of this. Um, I've been in both, both hands-on and social policy, but the fact of the matter is I can't sell preservation with the warm and fuzzy aspects of preservation to the rest of the old house and old building owners out there who think we're wacky because we have done a wonderful job in so many ways. We have more national register properties now, more local districts all over the country, but the one thing that we've really dropped the ball on is training people how to do cost-effective rehab. In every single town that I go to, there's two, depending on the size of the town, one to five preservation contractors. And they can charge whatever they want because they have no competition. Or you get what I call Preservation 101, where the rusty pickup truck pulls up to your house and he's going to learn 101 on your Preservation 101 in your house, and good luck to you, but he's going to charge you a fortune to learn it. The bottom line is, is that it isn't expensive if we train people how to do it. In the 1970s, we said, no more Vogue Tech programs. We're going to get rid of all this Vogue Tech because everybody's going to college. That was one of the biggest mistakes we've made from a social policy standpoint in this country because the fact is, we don't. So what do I do every single day of my life when I'm in town? A school bus pulls up to my school and unloads the unwanted children, the kids that everyone hates, the kids that never leave your town, the kids that never graduate from high school, the kids that are underemployed or unemployed or in jail, the Huck Finns of Hannibal. That's who they are. Half of them are girls and half of them are boys. They start when they're freshmen with me. And I started a program called the Preservation Trades Program. Now, these kids have no hope. These kids have the most horrible stories you have ever heard. Their families have been in Hannibal since 1818, and they've been the town dirtbags all these years. That sounds like a harsh word to use, but it's really true. And they've been looked down upon, and they've, and they've made fun of at the school. So I went to Hannibal High School, and I said, what are you doing with these kids? They never leave town. They're just, you know, it's a human resource, and you're just ignoring it. Well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to start a preservation trades program. I want you to bring them here in a bus in the morning and work all morning with me. I, I wrote the curriculum, and that's what we do. These kids went from an average of a D-minus grade average to a B average. These kids are going to graduate from high school. No one in their families has ever graduated from high school. These kids, the girls, half, half the class is girls. And by the way, guys, when women get the opportunity to, to start thinking in this way, they're way better than you. Sorry. Um, but it's just true, and it makes all the boys in the class just nuts because the girls are way better than them. When the girls first started, I lined them all up. I said, all right, tell me what your hopes and dreams are. To the girl, get pregnant, get out of high school as fast as we can. I said, well, no, let me, let me give you another thought. I said, men are shallow, and you don't need them. <laughs> and they're like, Men are shallow and you don't need them. We love women and we 
try, but we're very shallow. Let's just be honest about it. And so I said, what you need to do, whether you do this or not, is you need to become a woman, a human being in and of yourself. Do interesting things. You're smart. You're smarter than everybody tells you. I got them all off Adderall. They had these kids drugged up beyond your wildest dreams. Now they're off these drugs and we're dealing with them. Their grades are coming up. Instead of drugging them up, we're dealing with them and helping them. And so the, I said to the girls, you do this thing. You go do what, be interesting. Go to college. I'm going to help you. I'm going to be over at your house and tutor you. I'm going to do whatever I can with all these kids. And you will graduate from high school and you will go on to either do this kind of work or something else. And by the time you're in your mid-20s or 30s, you'll be such an interesting person that you'll attract, if you want to get married and you're straight or, 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 or gay, it doesn't make any difference. You're going to attract someone more interesting than you're going to get with that creepy kid down the street who's going to get you pregnant and you're just going to be like living in your mother's basement. And they're like, is that really possible? Is that possible? So my, my point to this is, is that we have a responsibility as a society to start training people how to do this work. It's not that hard. And it's not that expensive. Um, so anyway, back to the windows. Once we get all the paint off, we have to determine how we're going to weather strip these windows. And we'll get them all repainted and all this. But I use a system that's been around since the 18, late 1880s. My house was retrofitted with it in the 1890s. And it's still available today. It's a system made by the Dorbin Metal Strip Company in Chicago. All the best companies are in, China, in the Midwest, you know. And this is a ribbed piece of track. It's very flat. And it has this rib. And all we'd have to do is take, a, this is just a little mock up here, whoops. Let's take the side of the sash and take a router, and that's what this tool is, and cut a slot in the side of the sash, just like we did on this little sample. And then this fits in there, like that, and the window slides up and down on it. This gets screwed to the jam or the frame, the window goes up and down it. We never nail anything with windows anymore. Every, all these parts and stops and everything are all nailed and painted shut and we, we screw everything back in so we can unscrew it easily and tip the window out and clean it from the inside of the house and slip it back into its opening. So, by doing this on the side, this is a top sash. You're going to try it, bring it on over. Well, this misses it. You see, it's offset. So it actually misses it. And the rope's underneath here. So where do you what? Right here. All the way down. Does that make sense? See how, how that, that rib is offset? So if, if your groove is right there, you have a piece that's always an inch longer than the sash itself so that when you lift it all the way off, it doesn't come off the track. Um, hang on. So we do it on the sides. We do it on the top of the top sash, so that when you lift that top sash up into place, it goes over a rib piece of metal. Then, this is called a meeting rail. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I think so. All right. There. Yeah, I think it'll be all right. This is called a meeting rail. Meeting rails are always angled. And that's where the two sashes meet in the middle, your top of your lower sash, the bottom of your uh, upper sash. And that's where you get a lot of air infiltration. And the reason this is angled is that when the two sashes come together, they're angled, and, and, and they kind of pull themselves together. This is the original sash lock on this, and this was never intended for security in any way, shape, or form. Sash locks never been for security. They're to pull the meeting rails together tight so air won't come around them. What we do is we take that slotting bit in the router and we cut a slot right across here and we install this rubber gasket. And the reason we use a rubber gasket here, in my house, when they put the metal track into it, they had these metal 
pieces that interlock like that. But all the crap gets inside of them and they never, they bend. And, and this is that good down to 20 below zero. And it goes into the slot. And then if it ever wears out, you can just pull it out of the slot. It friction fits in. It's a really slick way to do it. And then on the bottom sash, the bottom rail of the bottom sash, we put another piece in underneath. And that, because old sills tend to never be quite square, and, and this is thick enough that it takes up any gap that would be at the bottom with your bottom sash. Now, some of you may or may not know, but this was all designed as an air conditioning system in the 1400s. You drop the top sash three inches, you raise the bottom sash three inches. Infrared photography on this shows all the heat and all the humidity blasting out the top gap and cool breezes coming in through the bottom. If you use your window the way it's designed to be used, you can save 8 to 15 percent on, on air conditioning costs in the summer. But people don't know how their windows work because of the aluminum triple track storm window. This window was never intended to take a hit from the weather, ever. A double hung window is not supposed to have direct weather touching it. Sleet, rain, screens even protect it a little bit from a hard driven rain. It, and all the replacement windows are all getting hit by direct weather. The only thing they ever come with, if they come with anything, is a screen, right, with a little cheesy frame. So most people don't even know their top sash operates, that there are pulleys and weights for the top sash. This is not a gothic torture tool. This is called a window zipper. And if your top sash is painted shut, you can run this along here on the front and the outside. It won't mar the paint, and it'll cut the paint line so you can get your sash free. If you're going to restore the window sash, it's nice to have one of these because likely that top sash is painted shut because of the moron that invented that aluminum storm who ought to be in prison because <laughs> aluminum conducts heat and cold. It doesn't insulate. Wood insulates. Glass is a terrible insulator of anything. It gets a little better if you've got some air gaps. And we all know kind of in our minds that an air gap is an insulator. But after an inch and three quarters, it starts to lose its effectiveness. But that's about what you end up with in a windows, uh, a situation like this with a proper storm. And an aluminum storm is not it because it only has a screen on the bottom. So once people, so we originally we protected windows with shutters. And then you had to be a weather person. You had to figure out when the weather was going to come and reach outside and close the shutters. My house is fully shuttered originally. I found four of them. Um, and then in the mid-Victorian era, they came up with this idea of wood storms. You start to go back and look at the old millwork, reproduction catalogs of old millwork, and you'll start to see wood storms. And then in the 1880s, the screening started, technology started to come around. You started to see screens, too. So that was kind of interesting. There were screens before that, but the technology to get it out to the consumer didn't really start kicking in until about then. So then we had those. But everybody whined because you had to get up in the spring and the fall and change them out. And what a pain that is. And then, of course, that's when this guy invented, I don't even know who it is, some moron invented the triple track aluminum storm. It's terrible. It's a, it does protect the primary sash, but not much. And people quit looking at their windows. You see, because in the spring and fall, they used to get up and look at their windows. If there was a little bit of rot or paint peeling, they could take care of it. And now, you put on an aluminum storm, you never look at your window again. Um, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a real a sad thing. Um, now, once we get this track in the sides, it's one finger operation, one finger. There, it's very slick zinc, and, and it has a, actually the track where the window rides up and down has two ribs on it. Pass that around. So, it's on your resource list. Did everybody get a resource list? Yes, right there. Everything I'm talking about to you today, most everything, is on that list. I, don't, I pay exactly what you pay to get everything that's on that list. I just want you to know, make sure you understand that. Here's something really unusual about this particular uh, window, is that here's the groove for the rope that comes up here, but they never finished it off. They left this piece here. It's brilliant. Now the Rope can't pull out, and these get worn, these holes where the knot goes, and over time, you know, your ropes will pull out, but this is designed so it won't. The other thing I love about this window is that the bottom rail of the upper sash sags and comes off of its mortise and tenon joints. It can never happen in the windows of my house because that's a dovetailed mortise and tenon joint. 
Now, mortise and tenon joint is this. This is a tenon, and this is the mortise. And that's how this is what we call a haunched mortise. See, when I did my apprenticeship, I had to learn how to do hand dovetailing, mortise and tenon joinery. I had to learn how every species of wood contracts and expands based on relative humidity, whether it's in Hamburg, Germany, or Des Moines, Iowa. And I didn't get to use anything electric until halfway through the apprenticeship. And when I, when I talk about doing things efficiently, Krebsbach, who is the master that I, that I apprenticed under, part of the German apprenticeship is you have to build a toolbox. And you present it to the master at a big traditional German dinner. My folks were there and, and everything. And I built this toolbox that looked like the Empire State Building. I mean, it was really cool. It had ebony wheels and inlaid silver and secret drawers. And it was this cascading thing. I mean, it was neat. I even thought it was neat. Took me two years to build it, and I presented it to him, and he's going all over it, and he says, this is the finest toolbox any apprentice has ever built. And he'd had like nine or ten apprentices in his life. And I was just like in tears, you know, I thought, because this meant a lot to me. Um, I wanted to be a good furniture maker and designer. And then I turn to my dad, and I'm hugging my dad, and I hear this horrible noise, and we turn around. He has a sledgehammer. And he's making it into splinters like the Tasmanian devil. My dad is holding me back to keep me from killing him. I'm like, you, I mean, I'm like on him. But, and he's, I, why, you just told me it was the best of the apprentice ever. Why are you doing this to me? He said, I'm doing it to you just like I've done to every apprentice. And by the way, I've never done this to an apprentice of mine. Um, I've done this to every apprentice because you are no craftsperson. And he used the word craftsperson. Isn't that interesting? You didn't, you say craftsman. You are not a craftsperson. A craftsperson is someone who builds something fine like that very fast. And that's what a true craftsperson is. I know lots of people that can build nice things. I know lots of small contractors that can do very beautiful work. But can they do it in an expedient manner? Are they able to think 40 steps ahead and understand the entire project and all the puzzle pieces that fit in so that they're very efficient in how they do it? Carve flowing beard faces on Tudor mantles. I had one in Davenport, Iowa. I used to take my high school students there and there. I'd say, how long do you think it took them to car? Each one was different. There were nine of them going around this chimney fireplace. Oh, it must be week, months. I said, no, about 20 minutes for each one. 20 minutes. Because they knew exactly where to cut it. They knew how far it was up off the floor. They knew exactly how to do it. They chopped it all out into the bulk. They carved it. They took their chisels. They knew what they were doing. It's called expedient crafts. I'll use craftsman, craftsmanship. And, and we don't know how to do that. We've lost it. We've, we're losing it. And I refuse to let it die. I, I really believe that we can make it work. So anyway, you just don't see windows made like this anymore. And these are all handmade in Hannibal. Hannibal is where, you ever heard of Warehouser? OK. Warehouser originally was called Warehouser Denkman. It was based in Rock Island, Illinois. They clear cut all the old growth floors in the Mississippi Valley from Canada down to Hannibal and floated all the logs to Hannibal, where they were all milled. Hannibal was the largest milling place in, in the country. <laughs> so we have all these old growth logs. Down in my basement, there are all the floor joists are three inches by 14 inches. And they all have these two and a half inch diameter holes in the floor joists everywhere. And none of them are in line with each other. And if, I'm thinking old piping, old steam system, I couldn't figure it out. And the local history guy came over and he said, oh, gosh, no. Those were augered holes through the logs. Chains were put through them to make, chain, uh, to make log rafts to float them down to Hannibal from uh, uh, Wisconsin and Missouri, or uh, Minnesota. So, you know, we find all kinds of interesting things. All right. Once we get all the paint off of a window sash and we get the glass out, we have to clean the glass, and that's really important before you put it back in. If you want your, your window job to last a long time, you need to clean the glass. You know, you just use Windex or alcohol, whatever you want. Some people like to use newspapers, but you have to take a razor blade knife and get all the old putty off of it, and you're going to find all kinds of goobers and paint spills and that kind of thing. So you have to clean off all the old glass. And then, um, Uh, you, have to clean, you have to clean out the glazing bed. Now, uh, if, we'll, we'll just uh, assume that this is, here, let me, the, if this was a glazing bed right here, and the glass set in there, and then it had putty in it, 
It's got all this old brown and crap, and it looks terrible. And you have to scrape all that out on both sides of the glazing bed so that it's down to bare wood. It's really important that we do that. Now, you don't ever want to put the glass back in until you've either oil primed or used boiled linseed oil, which I use a lot of, uh, to coat that bed because raw wood will suck the oil out of the putty when you put the glass back in. Right. One of the most frustrating things for, for homeowners, especially, is glazing. How many people recognize this? All right. yeah, this is caca. Don't ever use it. All right. you, why? Because that, if you paint that before 28 days, it will fail. If you don't paint it, it will fail. And that's per the chemist adapt. It's garbage. It doesn't work. It's all soybean-based, and there's a formulation in it, so you can't add boiled linseed oil to it. I use this. This is called Glazol, and this is made by UGL. I think it's on the resource list, but if it's not, you can write it down. Glazol by UGL. All the hardware stores and paint plate, they sell this. They don't have it stocked. You have to go in and say, I want you to order it, and then a UGL guy comes by about once a week. You can buy gallons, quarts, or pints. It has a little bit of, of, of soybean oil in it to keep it soft, but you can add, and you must add, boiled linseed oil to it. When I buy a gallon, I put a quarter cup of boiled linseed oil into it. Not raw linseed oil, boiled linseed oil. In the old days, I used to coat all the old wood when I get it stripped down with boiled linseed oil, fir with boiled linseed oil first, then oil prime. But I've discovered, talking to the chemists at the, paints, at the paint manufacturers, that there's still one primer out there that's just loaded with boiled linseed oil. It's a stock primer that you can buy, and it's uh, the number 100 Benjamin Moore Alcott Exterior Oil Primer. It's the only one. People often ask me what I use. I sure as hell don't use Sherwin-Williams, let's put it that way. Um, and that's probably going to tick off somebody. But the truth is, is that I'm not a fan. I, I look at what the solid content of the paint is, resins and solids. I want it to be above 40%. Benjamin Moore is about the only place you can get that. Pratt & Lambert used to be one of the top of the line paints. Sherwin Williams bought them. Uh, they, you ever heard of Mott's? Remember the Mott's paint? Sherwin Williams bought them. And then the next thing you know, they're closed down. So, uh, you know, some people like Sherwin Williams, more power to them. As far as I'm concerned, it just it doesn't have the solid content. It's like painting your house with colored water. And they make a product that is the most deteriorous product that, uh, on the market today for old houses, brick and or wood. It's called Duration. Duration is an elastomeric paint. Duration is like, take, if you put duration on a brick structure or on a wood structure, you might as well take the house and put it in a doubled up garbage bag and seal it off. Elastomeric paint does not breathe at all. It sticks like iron. So duration goes onto a house and sticks like iron. The vapors inside the house as they're trying to escape from the house, because that's where the most of the moisture problems in old houses come from is from the moisture that you're creating inside. And as it tries to escape, it's pushing duration off, and it's taking the face of the wood off with it and the face of the bricks off with it, every, all over the country. Elastomeric paints are not designed to be painted on buildings, because buildings breathe, bricks breathe. A brick, if you take a brick, it's two inches by four inches by eight inches. And you, an old brick especially, because they're softer fired. It will actually grow in size in 100 years. It will be bigger than it was. As it takes moisture in and out of its cell structure, it actually increases in size. Not much, but enough that you could actually measure it. So we, 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 we have to understand how air moves and how moisture moves. Very important. Um, any questions so far? I have a question. How does a blind person and a deaf person get involved with things like this because I know they can do it just as effectively as the sighted person can. I, I guess find somebody who's sighted that can show you how to do it. And how about the deaf? Uh, I, I've had several deaf people that have worked for me over the years. That's not an issue. We just have to learn to sign, you know, uh, for the folks that aren't deaf. So it works out pretty well. Uh, There's another question. Yeah. Just a what does duration do to wood structure? To what? A wood structure. 
Well, it's I mean, just, what's it, what's it's retaining the moisture. So what's well, happening it, to it, the wood? It doesn't breathe. Right. So when you put an elastomeric coating on the outside of any structure, we create warm, moist vapors inside houses. It's why you never blow insulation into the side walls of an old house. 80% of the houses that have insulation blown into the sidewalls of them will not hold paint anymore. Because we create warm, moist vapor. Some families more than others. But I mean, you've got plants and cooking and showering and all this kind of stuff. And we create, especially in certain areas of a house, it's all right. in certain areas of a house, we create a lot of a moist, warm, moist air. And it's not attracted up or down, it's attracted to the outside walls. It finds the hairline cracks in your walls, it finds the casings, the outlets, and it migrates into the wall cavity. If you have an empty wall cavity, it might condensate, but there's nothing there to hold the moisture, per se. You blow cellulose insulation into the side walls of your house, we have opened up, in 80% of the houses that we've opened up, what we found is we can reach inside the wall and pull the cellulose out and wring water out. And, and that just permeates the backside of the sheathing and causes paint to fail. So moisture's constantly moving. It's on the move. It's looking for air infiltration. And elastomeric paint sticks so tight to wood that the, the water vapor comes in and pushes it with enough pressure, hydrostatic pressure, that it pulls away from the wood, but it takes the face of the clapboard and the trim off with it. Sixteenth of an inch or so. It's amazing. Scary. <laughs> well, what is the primer that you mentioned, the, the you Benjamin Moore? Benjamin Moore's, it's their number 100 exterior grade Alkid primer. Another question I had is, um, have you heard of hemp oil for paint, and is that better? Yeah, I think there's some real technology coming? coming with hemp oil, and let's not forget that hemp has been around in windows for a long, long, long time. I wouldn't try to smoke this, but uh, this is hemp rope. This came out of my house. Top sashes. Had never had the ropes changed. And uh, I mean, it's really interesting, isn't it? It's not braided, it's twisted, but you know, that's what we used. Hemp has a wonderful applications to so many things if we can get over this craziness about um, not, want, you know, the whole thing about, you know, the war on drugs and marijuana and hemp. Give me a break. Um, so, that's interesting. Now, since we're on to ropes, let's finish up that thought. Ropes are really important to how we do things because we've done some studies here recently. If I can find it on my study. Oh, there it is. We've done some studies recently, and I used to use this rope all the time. I used to use this rope all the time. This is nylon braided rope and because it seems stronger. But we've done some studies now, and we found that cotton rope is better. Now, I buy a cotton rope that has a nylon center because nylon is strong. It's not sustainable because it's made with oil, which I don't like. It's hard to find pure cotton rope. You can buy it. And you can get hemp rope, too, still that's braided. And, and so I would encourage people to look for that as well. The, um, but the cotton rope will withstand UV light much better than the nylon. So you can get about 30, 35 years, maybe sometimes 40 years out of a cotton rope and about 16 to 18 years out of uh, nylon rope. Um, the difference is, is if you get paint on this, it'll rot away right away. So you got to keep paint. Don't paint your rope by accident. Keep the paint off of it, and it'll last a long, long time. But it's a much more sustainable product, and I think that's important as we keep talking about it. Now, some people will want to go to a pulley like this. This is called a Pullman. You can still buy them today. It's like a strong tape measure because they want to insulate that, 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 that weight pocket, but I don't want you to do that, because this will eventually break down, even though these are actually very well made. And there's nothing simpler than a weight, a rope, and a sash pulley. Now, the one thing that, that I think that a lot of people don't know is that a window weighs a certain amount. These window sashes right here weigh 14 pounds. This sash is a seven pounder, and it actually says in Roman numeral seven pounds on it. Each weight is half the weight of your window. That's why if you retrofit that, that, that laminated glass into an old window like this, it'll increase the weight and, and you won't be able to use 
the counterbalance system for your weight. So it's really important, especially uh, what I do is I have convinced the local vinyl pi pirates that are stealing all of the original windows out of houses in my community to drop them off on my front porch once a week. They drop off these, they drop off all the pulleys, everything. And I'd rather have them do that than take them to the dump because then I can take those sashes apart and I save the old cylinder glass so that when I'm replacing glass, I'm replacing it with glasses very similar to what was in it before. And th this is very thin and brittle. Yeah. How do you cut that? How do you cut this? I, I cut it just like I cut normal glass. You have to have a glass cutter and you have to have oil on it and you have to have a you can't do it on a flat piece of wood. You've got to have a really, really tight nap commercial carpet on top of your, on top of your bench in order to cut it effectively because it's not flat. I mean, you can all see how wavy this glass is. This is 1859 glass. It's pretty amazing. <clears throat> so anyway, that's, that, that's important. Now, the other thing about, about putting in glazing putty, once, w w if, if, when all the putty's out, and, and we've cleaned up this glazing bed with the scrapers so that we're down to bare wood and there isn't any of the glazing putty on it anymore. We either have to prime this as we prime the whole thing with the oil primer, or we use boiled linseed oil to coat the glazing bed. Because if, you, if your wood is dry, it'll suck the oil out of your putty. I mix up glazol. I take a quarter cup of boiled linseed oil into a gallon, but if I'm just taking out a large ball in my hand, I make a little crater in the middle and put about four drops in it. And then I mix it all in. I mean, it's so greasy, it sticks to your hands. And if you ever are going to do glazing and make a snake, then you, then you don't really don't know what you're doing. Don't make a snake, okay? Get a big old ball and you just jam it in. Now, we set the glass before we put the glazing putty in. In the old days, we'd take the glazing putty and put it in this bed and set the glass down into it, squeeze it, and then put these little metal things that we call glazing points and just to hold it in place. I don't do that anymore. I use this. It's the only thing that DAP makes that I like. It's their Alex uh, latex siliconized caulk. And the reason we use this is because if the glass breaks, I, it'll pull out. And it's a much forgiving for the glass. It's 150 years old. It's really hard. To say stay Take this and I right along the bottom, and then I set the glass into it. Put my glazing points in. Then I take my my glaze all that has the boiled linseed oil in it and I jam it with my fingers in here because good glazing is all about pressure. Believe it or not, the more pressure you put on it when you're, when you're just setting it in there rough and the more press, pressure that you put on it with a glazing knife, I, I, I actually use two fingers when, I, when I'm glazing to put tons of pressure in as I go all the way around this. And that, that really helps. The other thing I do is I take a little plastic cup, I set it on the middle pane or wherever I can, put a little boiled linseed oil at the bottom, and I dip the tip of my knife in so that every time I'm pulling a bead, I've got a little boiled linseed oil on my knife and in the putty. And you'll never get tears. You'll never get pulls. Everybody's so frustrated with that because it's such crap, and it tears out, and you can't get it to sit, sit down right. You'll have, little, you'll have boiled linseed oil puddling in the corners. That's all right, a little, little paper towel will soak that up. Just be careful with boiled linseed oil. It can spontaneously combust. Literally had a rag soaked with it in the middle of a floor with nothing around, a concrete floor, and just stood there for about 20 minutes with a friend and watched it catch on fire. <laughs> I have these special metal containers that we put those kinds of rags in, but you can take the rag and set it over the edge of a garbage can until it dries, and then you can throw it away, and it's all right. Um, it's, it's old school stuff, but it really does work. The old putty that we used to get from this company in Chicago used to come in these five gallon pails. And you'd open it up, you couldn't even see the putty. There was so much boiled linseed oil floating at the top. But there's all these, you know, new EPA rules and stuff like that about sending stuff. And with, uh, you know, uh, Homeland Security and 
I mean, I've, I've had a full body cavity search twice now flying on airplanes because I, of that infrared heating device. Yeah, they don't like that. Well, because this isn't gla because it's not glazing, it, 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 it'll 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 concave, it'll shrink. It's uh, you know this uh, caulking or, or glazing in a tube is garbage. Don't use it. A lot of people want to try to use it. It's got a special little tip on it so you can make an angle. It doesn't look right. It doesn't work well. Um, so that's how I do that. Um, so it, the bottom line is is that now we have the glass back in. We've either oil primed the whole sash, we've glazed the putty, put the uh, boiled linseed oil putty in here, and we're ready to reinstall our sashes. Once, once we get this slot in the sides, what's interesting about how this goes back in is that you put your track into the slots, you put your ropes in first, put this, these into your slots and then you just slip it into its opening. And then you lift the window up and screw these to the sides. It's not that tough and it's, it's, it's easy to get apart as well. Now another thing that some people like... Yeah. Well, this is called a pulley cover. We do get some air infiltration through the pulley. There's a guy in Minnesota that takes recycled polyethylene and he makes these covers and they have a gasket on the back that fit over and they've got a hole at the bottom so the rope can come in and out. And so that can stop some air infiltration around that pulley pocket that, uh, that so many people are concerned with. Yeah. I had two questions. Mm -hmm. So do you use glazer's points or not? I do. Absolutely do. And do you shoot them in with a, no, like a I red don't devil because deal? No, here's the thing. He's talking about there's a glazer's sh thing that will shoot the triangular shaped uh, glazing. Here, let me show you. Um, that's what these are, yeah. Um, cylinder glass is very brittle. And as such, if I use one of those tools, I tend to break glass all the time. This is a triangular glazing point. Um, this is huge. But it goes in here and holds that glass in, actually down in here. Now, the ones that I use are, are what I call footed glazing points. And they look like this. And this is what you can buy just about anywhere. They have, actually have a little foot on them, which makes it nice when you're doing this because with that little foot, you can take the glazing point like that and rock it into place until the little feet are up against the wood. Now, sometimes we have to cut off a, Part of it because it sticks out too far. These are very delicate muttons. And these are actually deeper than they'll stick out beyond the putty. So we actually will take these and cut them off with a, a pair of tin snips. And uh, but you can buy these anywhere. And most people, if you live in a house that was built from 1870 forward, you're not going to have muttons that fine in most cases. And then my second question is, uh, you said with your parting stop and your inside stop, you reapply those with screws rather than nails. Was there a certain type of screw that yeah. you use? So um, let me show you a couple things. This is the screw that I use. It's a number four screw for the metal track. It's just a tiny little number four screw. Hmm? Yeah. And I drill the hole in the metal a diameter that's just a little bit smaller than the head of this because you can't this metal's so thin you can't countersink it but if you drill a hole that's a little bit smaller than the head of that it'll countersink itself a little bit and that works out pretty well then when I'm doing the interior stop that's the stop that has the molding profile that you can see from the inside and if this was a lower sash this would be what you'd see and I use these stop gap th these are a, an adjuster and they have an oval hole in them. And it's actually a th half inch hole that you drill into the original stop once it's stripped. And then a round headed screw, or you can use a flat headed screw if you want. But they generally come with uh, an oval uh, round headed screw like this. And I always use 
slotted screws on historic houses because they didn't have Phillips screws. So what's nice about this is that I can move this back and forth so that in the winter time, if I want this to be even tighter, I can move this molding right up to the window sash and in the summertime, I can loosen the screw, pull it away from that if I want to operate it. This, is, this was an arts and crafts era invention. Uh, they're called Stop Bead Adjusters. Killian's Hardware, killians.com, uh, K-I-L-L-I-A-N-S, Killian's. Great hardware store online. You have all this preservation stuff that you can get. Really neat. Now, the parting stop, that's the stop that separates the upper sash from the lower sash. And it's always that one that's all painted in there, nailed in, and I just bust them up and throw them away because I can buy this at Lowe's all day long stock. I don't because I make my own, but you can buy it at Lowe's. And we drill a hole through it on the edge, and we use a flathead. These are the kits that my students use when they're in my window boot camps. So we drill a hole through here, and we use a flat-headed, slotted screw like this. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't build things that require the, the people themselves to adjust them because they don't. Right. You know, I mean, or, or, or require any sort of yearly maintenance because it doesn't get done. Right. As an architect, I understand what you're saying. Bob, that, could you repeat his question so that we yeah, have Here, let, let, let's get the mic over there because I think it's a really good question. And it's something that you're up against as an architect every day of your life, you know. Go ahead. I just asked if, if he feels that living in uh, an historic house is something that ordinary, everyday people can do, or does it take the sort of passion and commitment that uh, maybe the people in this room have? Because in my experience, mm -hmm. things that require seasonal, monthly, yearly adjustment just mm -hmm. simply don't get done. And if the house gets sold, it, maybe it gets done with the first owner. But it, if the house gets ho sold in seven years, the people that buy it from them don't do it. It's a good question. And I'll, I'll address it this way. I believe that old houses are for most people. I don't think they're for everybody. I also don't think everyone should own a home. I like the idea that we've worked really hard in this country to get people that ordinarily wouldn't be able to own a home into them. But one of the biggest uh, repossession rates of any organization in this country is Habitat for Humanity, and they are the symbol of bad infill in this country. If you want the mothership to be plopped down in your neighborhood, Habitat does that. They've helped a lot of people, and I appreciate what Habitat does. I had Jimmy Carter on my syndicated radio show years ago when he first started this out, and I thought the impetus was good. And it all depends on the local director. Some of these organizations are doing rehab, and, which is more sustainable and more, more green type of work. But the truth is, is that there is no such thing as a house that doesn't need maintenance. There is no such thing. And if people with spendable income are buying homes, architect design homes today are probably people that have pretty good incomes, wouldn't you say, in general. So they're hiring people to do the maintenance. Because the ma there is no such thing as no maintenance. When somebody says there's no maintenance, it means it can't be maintained, it's just garbage. There is no such thing as no maintenance. So when I, who buys the houses that I restore? My houses are completely rehabbed from top to bottom. They're made sustainable. They're made energy efficient. They have second floor laundries. They have walk-in closets where the maid's room was. All the trim matches, all the architecture. The outsides are complete museum quality re uh, 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 restorations. The insides are almost that way, but we take it like something from a kitchen pantry and we make the cabinets to match it and we do things that are how people live today we're putting in six burner stoves and 1200 cfm range hoods and and, and and we're doing things that are attracting people that would normally go to a new development into the central city because they know they're going to have to maintain an intelligent person knows they're going to have to maintain something whether it's new or old but if they can buy something that's been rehabbed from top to bottom from somebody that they that has a good reputation they, they, a lot of people will buy an old home that wouldn't. 
because they have that confidence level. And if they're going to hire people to do the maintenance work, they're going to hire people to do the maintenance work. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but I, 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 I don't buy in. I, I, I think we always have to be building new. We need, God, architects are so important in this country, we don't use them. The AIA, the American Institute of Architects, has dropped the ball so hard. And I train architects. I'm, my school's certified for AIA. I love architects. But the AIA could have, after the Frank Lloyd Wright era, continued that thinking process about doing residential design. But there's not much money in it for these guys, men and women. So they're doing more of the institutional and more of the commercial work. But if I ask an architect like you, if somebody's going to build an $800,000 house out in Coralville or wherever they're going to build one, would they get and have a, design, a builder design it, like so many of these houses, our stock designer built thing. If you could get $100,000 to design a house and they only spent $700,000 on it, would they get more house, better house, better use of space, and more sustainability than buying a cheesy builder house out in the burbs? Well, they would, wouldn't they? They would. And you would be happy making hundred grand off that, wouldn't you? Well, that would, no, but I mean, that's the point. Why would anyone hire a builder to design their house? That's insane. It's insane. We need architects. We need that beauty. We need that texture. We need the use of space. We need these things in our life. We're human beings. We're animals like every, every other animal on this planet. But we've evolved to a certain point where, where art matters. And if we, if we walk away from it and we start putting vinyl siding on all these houses and make them all look like generic cereal boxes, where is the art in that? Where is the art in a house being built in the birds that has a Queen Anne Tower, you know, a, a pediment over the door, you know, a porch you couldn't even sit on if you wanted to? I mean, where is the art in that? Do we forget the Greeks and how they, all these wonderful proportions that they, they, they taught us? How, uh, this drives me nuts. So anyway, the primary window sash, once you get that weather stripping in, you get that rubber seal here and at the bottom of it, no air can get in around this. This is now completely free from air infiltration. Part of the reason for that is because the way this track works as it goes into this slot is it's virtually impossible for air to come in, come around here, come through here, and come back in here. I mean, is there some? Yeah, but functionally, there's no more air infiltration. Is there some play in that slot? Just yeah, yeah, yeah. We make the we make this slot just a hair bigger than the actual fin itself, so it'll actually travel. But it's literally one finger. So when that whole unit is shut, and you turn that sash lock, you have a window that won't have any air infiltration, that will exceed a double pane window and its efficiency just from that air infiltration standpoint. Yeah. Wait, here she comes. Run, librarian, run. I've been married to a librarian that got her degree here. Do they still have a degree yes, program? I thought they were thinking about getting rid of it. No. Good. I'm you good. mentioned the window sash lock. If you have a wide window, 43 inches or, or bigger, mm -hmm. isn't it best to replace the single sash lock with two yes. sash locks? Yes. Okay. And if you'll look at this little tiny, where is that piece of crap vinyl window? It's over here. Okay. And the glass is falling out. And the glass what? The glass is falling out. Good. <laughs> this little window has one sash lock on it. All right? But you get another six inches wider than this, and all vinyl windows have two sash locks on them because they're so cheesy and flimsy. They have to have them. 42, 48 inch wide wood window, always best to have two sash locks because it'll pull those meeting rails together nice and snug. Could, could you just show how those, um, what are they called, the weather stripping fits together, the one piece into the other? How do you, um, you mean the track system? Yes. Well, the track system gets, a, there's a slot here. We'll just pretend there's a slot. It goes all the way down here. Top sash, there's a slot so that this gets screwed screwed to the top of the jam, up at the top. 
and you've got a side piece coming down over here and a side piece coming down over here. So when this goes up, it slots in to the top and it, and it's, and it has the track on the side. Does that make sense? I'm not sure about the track on the disc, side part. If you get, raise your hand. If you get the disc from them, it has an actual pictures of everything. Um, and I would encourage you to do that. So we'll get a disc for the library as well. And so It, if you go to the, Tim, we can talk about that later after we're done. Um, we also have the, the link to COSC on our Eco Iowa City web page link off of the, right. the library. So, and somebody had a question up here, I believe. Yes. Um, when you um, get your uh, weather stripping um, fabricated mm -hmm. in your slot, in the side, do you want it flush to the stop? You want it, you want it flush. You want the strips flush to the outside of the sash, right? Right. Do you want that flush to the stop, or do you want a little play? Well, there's a lot of play, side yeah. to side play. Well, I mean between the stop and the sash. Well, the, the, the stops are no longer do anything but help the stop air infiltration. The stops, the parting stop, which is the one that separates. The upper and lower sash. Right. It, 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 it has no function anymore. Well, and, and, not, and the interior stop, the one with the stop with the with the adjuster in it, it, it it's it, it, the only function it has is if you want to loosen it up and push it tight to the window in the winter. You don't even have to, because the track is now taking doing all the work. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, somewhat. I mean, but it's just a matter of the if functioning disc, of the of the. the Dorbin company has this wonderful graphic from the 1800s that shows you exactly how to install it, how it works. It's a little tough. I, you know, if I'm doing a hands-on thing, we do this all the time, but it's a little tough to. I don't know if I'm helping you or not. Well, I just uh, another question. Um, when you replace the parting stops. And the windows I put back in, I'm, more often than not, I, they seem to be tied at the bottom and there's a top only. Is that for a purpose? I mean, is that stop, the parting stop supposed to kind of float in there or is it? Well, in, the in theory, it was supposed to be something that could come in and out easily. But they all get painted shut. They got, usually have a nail down from the top and up from the bottom or maybe sometimes in the middle. It just depended. Uh, three screws is all I use. I don't care how tall the windows are. There's no reason to use any more. Three inches up from the bottom, three inches down from the top, and one dab in the middle. Uh, the fewer screws for a part that isn't needed for anything other than stopping airflow now is, is, is an important part of that. Now, let, let me, before we take any more questions, let me, let me go to the next step here, which is just as important. If you want to get that, uh, get a, uh, a U value in the th three range or the, even the high two range, You've got to go with a storm window. And the aluminum storm window just isn't going to cut it. So I, I use this. This is not the, I make my own. I don't, this is like a traditional screen. Um, this is a permanent screen. This is made by Dubuque Sash. They call it Adams Architectural in Dubuque. They bought Adams Architectural. And they do not make this storm the way that you're seeing it now which is with true through mortise and tenon joints. They do slot tenons. They're not quite the same. They're good windows, as good as you can get for a consumer. Um, Adams are, it's on your resource sheet. But this particular storm is interesting because it has removable glass panels or screens. Now, I, when I order these from Adams in the past, before I started making them myself, I didn't order them with this screen at all. I would just order them with screen panels and glass panels, and they come in different colors, and uh, that I could and take out, put in the closet, and insert. I never have to take this wood frame down. If you do this, especially on upper floors, uh, it's pretty nice because if you, all you have to do is pop this out, and then you pop your screen, and you can see this is kind of dirty, but it's got a built-in built, built weather strip that beds right into this. And here's an, another piece that shows a couple of different 
colors. And, and I make the, I make that, the, the aluminum channel is bedded in right into the wood. So it doesn't have the same uh, uh, problems that you see with an aluminum storm conducting heat and cold. And there's a piece of it here somewhere. We can find it. Um, yeah, here it is. So this is the chain. I buy this. I buy this uh, from Do It Best online, and it's got these little corners that fit in here. And we miter this on a miter saw uh, with a carbide blade, and we make these frames. And this built-in weather strip makes it really tight, and it's a pretty slick little operation. I still like to get up and put a puttied storm on in the fall, and take it down in the spring and put up screens. It's kind of a zen thing for me. But you can see how a storm like this would be more usable, less hassle. Marvin makes a wooden storm. Marvin is the only decent wood replacement window company uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, now, that's my opinion based on my experience. Uh, Marvin is, was started by some executives that left the big window companies out of frustration. And they make better retrofit windows for commercial and residential buildings than any company as far as I'm concerned. I can buy single pane windows. I don't have to buy insulated glass from Marvin. You can't do that at Pella, and you can't do that at Anderson. And they still make a wooden storm, Marvin does. Now it's self storing, so it's got this vinyl channel around the inside of the wood with the break your fingernails off self storing, and it only comes with one screen, but it is authentic looking wood storm that is a way better than any aluminum storm and comparable in price. Yeah, do we need it here? Yeah, I'll hold it. There you go. I'm just curious as to the approximate cost per window of something like that. For, that. for the storm? For the storm. You know, if you don't do anything to your window and you put this storm in here, and I think it's a really good question, um, you're looking at anywhere, if you, buy, if you go to Adams over in Dubuque and you buy this convertible storm, you're looking, depending on size, anywhere from 160 to 350 bucks. Um, try to get a, a divided light window that comes, you know, everybody says, oh, well, you know, I can get these replacement windows with snap-in grills. I'm sorry. Any preservation commission that allows that is not following the Secretary of the Interior's guidelines for rehabilitation because it isn't the same. The depth, the profile, everything is different. You have this flat glass all over. You don't have the divided lights and the texture and the reflections are so different. <laughs> that it's really important to do that. Um, the, the storm, this is the second important part of this, is weather stripping this storm. Now, the key to weather stripping this storm comes from these two products. Both of these come from Dorbin as well. Dorbin is what the best weather stripping company in the world. This is door weather stripping. You see, this is wooden. It's got the rubber coil here. This is metal. You can get it in all different kinds of finishes. It's got the same rubber that I use in between the sash rails. I buy this in 100 foot, 100 foot rolls for my meeting rails in the bottom rail, and then I buy this stuff. And you take and you put the storm, you put the storm up in place, and you can use traditional storm hangers. And I've got them laying here somewhere too. I'm just not sure where. But anyway, traditional storm hangers and hang this and put some eye hooks on the inside to pull it in tight to the wood. And then you come inside and you just install this all the way around it. And the rubber goes right up to the wood. And down at the bottom, we use three pieces. We have one piece here with a quarter inch gap, piece in the middle, quarter inch gap, another piece here. Because if you don't have the gaps at the bottom, two quarter inch gaps, we know condensation is going to get in between double pane windows. It's going to get in between this window and this. We have to have a place for the moisture to get out. A we pull. A just like the, the, the strip in the double pane window. So you can imagine this is good down to 20 below zero. This creates a really tight window opening. You, this is completely weather stripped all the way around. I gotta get this in the right way. Just like that. This is completely weather stripped all the way around. You have a tight window, you have a much better U value than even a triple pane window. Anybody have any more questions? We've got the mic. Who wants to ask a question? All right. 
the, the question I have is uh, the system here that you have, is, uh, how does that work with the pull-pin windows? It works just great. In fact, we're going to be doing it in, uh, at the Olea ca Chapel in Pierce, South Dakota next week. You use it the same way, right? use it exactly the same way. The only difference is, is, is that where you drill a hole into the jam, these little pull-pins that hold them in place, you know, they're kind of dangerous because the holes in the jam wear out after a while. I take small copper piping and I drill the hole and I friction fit a piece of copper pipe into the hole in the jam where the pin goes in and flare it on the outside so that it doesn't wear the wood out. So the little pin goes into the jam in a couple different places that way. And that works out really nicely. You sure? Yeah. Okay. No, I got it. Anybody else? Another question? Okay, there we go. After you've glazed your window in, how mm -hmm. long does it need to dry? Ah, this is it? the beauty. 28 days if you use DAP. You can, if you glaze this window with my greasy boiled linseed oil formula by 10 o'clock in the morning, you put a fan over it, you can be painting it at 2. If you don't put a fan on it, you can paint it the next morning. It gets a little bit of a skin. It's still soft. You can put your finger into it, but it has to get a skin. And that boiled linseed oil just makes it skin over, just wonderful. With that boiled linseed oil, you'd have to use oil-based paint. Mm -hmm. And is that all you ever use? You don't ever use the... Uh... Well, here's the deal. We had this conversation in Cedar Rapids this morning. Everybody's heard of VOCs, volatile organic compounds is what it is. And they're being... The EPA has said to states, you can voluntarily outlaw, you know, oil paints now. Illinois has done this. You can't buy oil primer in Illinois anymore. Missouri will be the last state to do it because, you know, Missouri, that's an interesting place to live, let me tell you. Um, the, uh, uh, and I don't believe Iowa has banned oil-based paints yet. Um, and hopefully they won't because the amount of VOC that comes from house painters, professional, and homeowners all combined is infinitesimal to the ozone layer into our environment compared to the factory emissions and all the, the, the automobiles and all the different things that are happening. So there's a trade-off. The chemists at the paint manufacturers tell me, when I talk to them every month or two, we're not there. Latex primer technology isn't there for old wood. It doesn't bite in. It, it just won't condition the wood the way that oil alkyl primers will. And we're not there yet. So I keep waiting to hear when they're going to be there. And I don't think that there's a lot, been a lot of progress on this. You've heard about these self-priming paints? Don't run away. Run away. You know, if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Um, the, so, so we have to weigh sustainability, green environmental issues, which are all important to what we do. But just the sheer nature of living in an old house, you, no, nobody's greener than you. Nobody. The embodied energy in that house, the labor that went into it, the labor to make the bricks and the mortar and the wood and the mill, all, all and, and all the, the coal-fired belching and farting machines that were in the big factories making your windows back in the 1890s, all of that has value today because we don't have to do it again. We don't have to go through that process. So all that embodied energy, both labor and manufacturing, has a huge influence on our environmental impact. If we tear these houses down or we get rid of these original plans, and John Leake, my good buddy, he has got a great website. It's called historichomeworks.com. Historichomeworks, plural, dot com. John's from Lincoln, Nebraska. He lives out in Vermont. I tried to get him to come back to the real world, but he's still living out in Vermont. So, but he and I research stuff together. We just, we're doing for the National Park Service, we're putting together this huge maintenance program for museum houses. And uh, by the way, if you're interested in a window boot camp, I have one coming up at the Campbell Center in uh, Mount Carroll, Illinois, uh, which is coming up, uh, I think, the second week of June. And uh, it's an old college that's been converted into a historic preservation school. And uh, we'll be up there. Four, we're, my classes in, in Hannibal are three days. This is four. So, uh, but I work you to death. Um, and that's the best way for people to learn. Yes, ma'am. Where's the mic? You have it. I do? <laughs> I feel like Phil Donahue. 
<laughs> um, you've done 7,000 of these windows. Over, I don't have yeah. the tools to do this. If I were to hire myself a carpenter or somebody, how's he going to know how to do this? How am I going to tell him how to do it? Um, Short without sending him to your boot camp, is that if he can't come? I mean, what do I do? How do we get the job done? I don't, there are people here from the Preservation Commission, right? I'm on the. I mean, on another you guys Preservation have a list Commission of certified contractors for the area. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they know your technique. It's pretty commonly known. It's not. I mean, yes, there's some things that I do that are specific. Um, people need to go to these schools and learn how to do it. <laughs> That's not going to get my windows hung before I die, though. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, if they come to boot camp at the Campbell Center, they'll come home and know how to do it from beginning to end, and how to make a living doing it. It's not just about teaching them how to do things, it's also teaching them how they can do it and make a living, because contractors deserve to make a living, too. Um, I don't know what to tell you, other than if you get that disc, everything's specced out on it. It can be much more complex than, than making a checklist. You get that list, that, that disc has all the tools you need, I have a disc that will be available to you through the sponsoring organization. Tell them. Tell them. So it'll be right here at the library. You can access it. It shows in detail how the weather stripping, the metal track is installed. It gives you the, the, the name of the rubber stuff and the code name to buy it and whatever, all the tools you need. It even gives you, and this ticks off some of the window restorers, right, what it should cost you to restore the average size window in detail. Now, when I train people, I have to train them towards me. This is how long it takes me to do this, 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 and this. So I can break down the, the amounts of an hour it takes me to do certain things. This is how much putty it takes and how much that putty costs. And here's how many glazing points at two cents a piece it costs. I have this broken down to a gnat's rear end so that the base cost for, for restoring a window, including a storm, is under 500 bucks, including a wood storm. But it doesn't include their profit. It doesn't include all the other things that go into small business. So you need to know that when you look at this, if you do get, if you do get a copy of that, that that's just what it takes for the labor and the materials straight up. Yeah. Do you have a list of Westside that is? Uh-huh. It's all, it's all listed uh, and all that stuff. Yes, sir. Yeah, he wanted to know. It's a 13 sixteenths, or this is a 13, 3 inch uh, slotting bit for the rubber, and it's a 5 30 seconds uh, bit for the track, because the track is exactly an eighth. And you want it to be a 30 second inch wider gap than the actual track, or it won't go up and down. Okay, just a, so we have like 12 minutes left of uh -huh. Sullivan's time. Are you running on track? I'm perfect. Excellent. Well, um, I'm not perfect, but I'm, <laughs> I'm grooving. Yeah, right. In a room in my house, I have a bank of three windows. Um, I do have wooden storms on the outside. And do I need to worry about insulating the mullions? Muttons or the mullions? No. I wish I had muttons, but the mullions. I'm, I've got three windows in a row. You know, they have got the trim piece in between them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I but you have, you have weights in there. Yes. So. But I took, I took a piece of trim off to have it copied for another mm -hmm. uh, place in my house. And there's just nothing between that piece of trim and the exterior piece of trim. Do I need to worry about that space at the all? Mo the mullion's piece of trim on the inside that separates the, the windows from each other. Window, individual window double hungs. If you take that piece of trim off and get inside that cavity, pull the weights out of the way, and caulk those joints at the back so to stop the air infiltration. That's what we're trying to do. You know, if you don't blow insulation into the sidewalls of your house, everybody's freaking out. Well, what do I do? If you do a good caulk job and a good paint job on your house, my paint jobs last 20 years. I, was, I did a house in the Sherman Hill Historic District in Des Moines, Iowa in 1982. They just repainted. 
That's a long paint job, man. And it's all about, it didn't cost any more than a cheesy power wash paint job. I train painters how to paint houses, get 15 to 20 year uh, uh, paint jobs, and give unlimited 10 year paint warranties. But you have to buy from the contractor a year, for a couple hundred bucks a year, a maintenance contract. So every year that contractor goes back in the spring and fall, looks at your house. If you get a little spot on your face, and you don't go to the doctor and have it checked out, you could die of melanoma. It's no different with a paint job or a window or anything. You have to maintain your home. And if you don't want to lift a finger, if, you want that, if you've got that McDonald's thing going on, hire somebody else to do it. But if a painter for $200 a year will guarantee a paint job from catastrophic paint failure for 10 years, if you find me a paint, painter that will do more than a year, two years at the most in Iowa City, and I'll give you 100 bucks. No, I won't. I lie. Okay, so you're saying to caulk the exterior. Absolutely. Moments, so not from the inside. You know, here's the thing. I think, I mean, you know, now this is my era and you may be my era, I doubt it, you look like you're about 25. The, uh, <laughs> um, imagine that two Huey helicopters have hovered over the top of your house, and they drop two cables down, and they ran under the peak, and they hook onto two lo uh, hooks on your roof, and they pull your house off its foundation, and they take it out to New York, and they put it underneath Niagara Falls. Now that's a vision, huh? So all this cascading water is coming over your house. You caulk every single joint that that cascading water can get into, but don't caulk anything it can't. So you never caulk clapboard joints because the water's cascading down. It can't come down and go back up and in. You need that airflow. But on top of a windowsill, where siding butts up to a corner, all the places cascading water can get into, you caulk. I go through cases of caulking when I'm doing an old house. And I, and then I also take all the paint down to the bare wood. And in the old days, I used to take six to eight of my people all su summer and fall. I never paint in the spring, and I hardly ever paint in the summer. I almost always paint in the fall. I do prep in the summer, but I never apply paint until the fall. Because in the Midwest, it's not as rainy in the fall. We have decent temperatures. And when you get in temperatures uh, over 75 degrees, 70% 70 humidity, you're going to have paint failure. It's not going to last. So, uh, but, but it used to take all summer and fall to prep a house, to get all that paint off, heat guns, scrapers. With that tool right there, I have big arms. I have tracks that I screw onto the eave that hold that thing for me. And we have eight of them. Two people with that and another one called the paint shaver, which shaves the clapboard off the face of the clapboard and the butt edge above it all at the same time, just like this, and puts it into a HEPA vac so there's no lead dust, five days, two people, instead of six to eight people for five months. Now you can start to afford to hire a painter who knows this technology. The problem is finding painters that know this technology. Um, it's all out there. I mean, whatever happened to self-pride? Whatever happened to contractors wanting to be on the cutting edge of the business that they're in? Uh, I see good contractors out there that, that do this. And they're the ones that are making a living. They're the ones that will be there in 20 years. But the fly-by-nights, the guys that just want to slap it up, they're not, you know, they're, there's no sense of pride in their work. And, and maybe, maybe it's just me, but it just seems to me that, 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 you know, being a preservation artisan is just that, being an artisan. I teach artisans at my school. I don't teach people to be carpenters. I don't teach people to be plasters. I teach them to be preservation artisans. It's a way of thinking. Yeah. Oh, here. I see fat and sassy cans of liquid wood up there and wood oh. epoxy that haven't been referred to, and I'm curious. Thank you. See, I get, you got, you got to rein me in every once in a while. i got five minutes left. We find some rot in sills and on window sashes. Remember I was showing you earlier a, a, a mortise and tenon joint? Or did I show it to you? Tenon, mortise, right? If this is rotted off, generally a homeowner probably either needs to take the sash to a woodworking shop to have a new tenon installed or they need to get a new window. I, I wouldn't do it because the, old, the rest of the wood in the sash is so good that it makes sense to try to Take, I save old growth wood. All my, like right now, I'm, I'm doing my entire kitchen in this house. 
Um, and we're using Baltic birch plywood for the boxes, but every door, everything that we're doing is 150-year-old floor joists out of a building that was being torn down. I've cut into it and found musket balls in the thing. I mean, it was really fascinating. I cut right into one with my bandsaw. Um, so I keep a lot of old growth wood around to do repairs. And when those vinyl pirates drop off those window sashes on my front porch, there's old growth wood I can use for patching. Um, but sometimes there's rot and, and the tenon's good. And, and so we, we take uh, some, I'll give you an example here. Let's see. This is off in Davenport, Iowa. This is a baluster. This is not called a spindle, it's called a baluster. A balustrade are railings and balusters that make up the balustrade. You can call them spindles if you want, but just for the sake of discussion, this is a baluster. And um, Parkey Burroughs built the house to block all the views of the Harned family. Harned von Maurer, you've all heard of that, von Maurer. It used to be called Harned von Maurer. He built, Parkey Burroughs built all the school buildings, all the best buildings in downtown Davenport. And then he built the Harned house and Harned decided on the bluff overlooking the Mississippi with panoramic views and Harned decided not to pay Mr. Burroughs. So Mr. Burroughs built his house, the next house down the bluff, so tall it blocked all of Harned's views. <laughs> They call it the, the Spite House in Davenport, which I love. And I, I got to own that one, as well as the most notorious gangster's house in the country. Yeah, how many of you ever heard, saw a movie called Road to Perdition? Tom Hanks. That was about John Looney from Rock Island. And they changed his name. Spielberg said that if we call him Looney in the movie, nobody will buy into it. So they changed it to Rooney. Um, I restored his mansion there. Uh, he, he, Al Capone was scared to death of John Looney. Every time he would send guys down to uh, Rock Island to take over Looney's action, they'd come back in a pine box. He ran all the prostitution, all the gambling, all the booze from the Canadian border to the Gulf Coast. And he had a magazine called the Rock Island News that was circulated in St. Louis and, and New Orleans, all the way up and down the Mississippi. And he would go to the, the, the mayor of Louisiana, Missouri, that's a town on the river, and say, you need to write me a check for 10 grand. And the mayor would say, yeah, well, whatever. And the next morning, the headline would say something awful like, mayor having homosexual love affair with, with, with nine-year-old boy in the alley behind his house. That's what these headlines said. And so, needless to say, the mayor started paying Looney off. He ended up getting, uh, going to prison, dying of tuberculosis. They had, guess what they got him on? Tax evasion. So this rot in the bottom of this, you can stick your finger in. I mean, I've been poking at it for a long time. But I, I just blow out what will blow out. I mix equal parts of A and B. This is Abitron. And I pour it into the rot so that it's completely consolidated. And it reconstitutes that old wood. And I want it rough because when I come in with the putty, I can, I can soak as much liquid A and B into that as I can, equal parts A and B until it won't soak up anymore. And then right away, I can come in with the putty. And um, here. Somebody else want one of my balls? Here. 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 God, pay attention. <laughs> that's the architectural epoxy. And this is what I was able to do with this. Now, it's V'd on the bottom because that's the way a good baluster is when it's sitting on a railing so that the water sheds off this of it. This is that epoxy solidified. This is it. Same stuff. You can shape it with belt sanders, chisels, sandpaper. It contracts and expands. The guy that invented it is from Germany. His job during World War II was to invent something that would repair the submerged portion of wooden boats. The guy knows contraction and expansion. Like we've tried them all. There's all these. There's the West systems. There's a whole bunch of different systems out there. And we always come back to this. Abitron makes the best. If you oil prime this, it will outlast the wood. It's structural, too. So if you have a column that's hooked up to the box beam and rotted at the bottom and it's just swinging, you can rebuild the whole base of it. It'll be stronger than it was the day it was put in. So we don't use a lot of this. We try to patch in wood when we can, but there's lots of times when something like that, you know how much this, this is a piece of old growth pine that if, I could, if, if, if they could find a piece that big, a woodworking shop would charge me 50 to 100 bucks a piece for these. 
20 minutes of my time and less than two dollars worth of material. And speaking of time, Bob. We're there? We're there. This has been, time flies when we're having fun. Yes. So I believe he will stay and answer questions, am I right, for a little while? Sure. For a little while, but. I need to get out of here pretty quick, though. I, I, I get to see, I've got front row seats to see Hal Holbrook be Mark Twain tonight. But, so can we all? Killians. Online. Online. Is there a lot of you go to Killianshardware.com. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm passing out surveys. They take 60 seconds. We love hearing what you have to say about our workshops, so we can always improve them. So please let us know if you liked Bob or not. <laughs> Tell the speaker to lose weight. <laughs> Also, we are an, a, a nonprofit based on memberships, so we'd love to have you involved. Check out our website. Our website is on all the, all the pens that you took. We've also got those in the back here, so thank you very much.